Conformal mappings are transformations that preserve angles. And conformal mappings of the plane have a long history bound up with complex analysis because many analytic functions are conformal mappings. As one of the other videos in this playlist will show you, functions are conformal mappings when they're analytic and their derivative is not zero. But this video just talks about conformal mappings in terms of mappings between the plane and itself without dealing with complex numbers. In order to talk about angle preservation, we need to talk about angles. And to that end, the angle between two vectors, v1 and v2, in the plane is given by a formula. It's the inverse cosine or the arc cosine of v1 dot v2 divided by the product of the lengths of v1 and v2. Now recall dot products work by multiplying components. So if I write down v1 and v2 as column vectors, like so, then I can write their dot product as multiplying the x components which is actually conveniently written as a matrix multiplication. And dot products don't care about ordering. They're commutative. OK, and so if I go ahead and write the angle between, say, v1 and v2, this is the angle from v1 to v2. It's worth noting that in conformal mappings, it's important to keep track of the direction or the sense of the angle. So here I've got a counterclockwise angle. So in order to get from V1 to V2, I want counterclockwise. I could have a situation where I had to go the other way, in which case I'll pick up a negative angle. OK, so conformal mappings are those that preserve angles, but they preserve angles between tangent vectors. And so in order to do this, I need to kind of link together tangent vectors and curves and such. So let me do that. So recall the tangent vector to a path. Well, what's the tangent vector? Well, the tangent vector involves taking a derivative of this function. <laughs> so if I take a derivative of this function, well, that means take the derivative with respect to t component-wise. like so. OK, so this is the tangent vector to a path. Similarly, I can use this kind of information to find the angle between two curves. Let's call the, those curves P and Q. And they have to intersect somewhere in order to find an angle between them. And these, these intersect at some point, let's say they intersect at time t, and the way to find the angle between these two curves, it's the angle between their tangent vectors. This makes sense if you think about it. But it's good to draw a picture so you can kind of see what's really at stake. So let's say I've got P. looks a bit like this. This is P of T. 
Remember, this is a not required to be a function because, well, it's a function of time, it's a function of points, but it's not a function in the sense that it's just, just y is a function of t. It's x and y, so it doesn't have to pass the horizontal line test, for instance. Here's q, certainly not passing the vertical line test. Here's the tangent vector to p at, say, let's say that t is right here. Here's the tangent vector to q. And so the angle between these two curves will be this angle theta. And so we can kind of say, so if this function f now transforms the entire plane. So I've got these two curves, and I'm now going to transform the entire plane. I'm going to drag along all the curves with it. And so if this is a continuously differentiable function, then it's going to drag along those paths. How do they work? They work by composition. is a path. So take my p, compose them. This is a path in the image of f. OK, so what this means is this means if I, if I grab the plane underneath these curves and dra it drags into some other place, it transforms it by some continuously differentiable function, well, that's going to drag along all of those curves and as a necessary result, then, it will also transform the tangent vectors. So the tangent vectors they too get transformed by f. This sounds deep until you realize it's just the chain rule. In which case, of course, it's deep, but it's not too difficult. The chain rule in multiple dimensions is easy enough to write, and it's kind of deceptively simple. It's something like f prime times p of t times p prime of t, right? That looks like the usual old chain rule, but now you have to realize f is a function of two variables, taking input two variables and output two variables. And p takes in an input one variable and an output Two. That means that this dot right here, it's not exactly what it seems. This dot is actually multiplication of, well, this p prime of t is a vector, and that's because it involves derivative with respect to t of two different components. But now I also have two inputs for f, not for p. And so that means that I really have, this is really a matrix vector multiplication. And so this f prime is really, this is really a two by two matrix. And this p prime, as we just said above, this is a vector in R2. When I do this 2 by 2 matrix times a vector in R2, I end up with a new vector in R2. Now, this 2 by 2 matrix has a special name. This is called the Jacobian matrix. It's the matrix of all the possible partial derivatives of f. And they're organized in a nice way. So let me show you how this goes. And it essentially is the chain rule a bunch of times. So if I write it out, let's write out just the x component. So just the x component. Well, f the x component is a function of two variables, that being the two p outputs. So 
So I'm threading the, the time t into the p along the path, and then take the path coordinates, which are x and y coordinates, and put them to f. That transforms it into two more coordinates. This is the first of them. If I write out the chain rule in two variables, I'll get something like this. That's sort of an obvious term there. Oops. Then there's a, a less obvious term. That's the y component side of things, as in the y components of p side of things. You can kind of think of this as convenient to mix Newton and Leibniz notation, if you like, just to kind of emphasize what's going on. Now, for better or for worse, this is what also happens for the y component, except that it's y components everywhere on the f. So kind of see that. Let me do this. Let me copy, paste, and then do a little cleanup. And the thing to do is everywhere I saw an x on the f, Everywhere I saw an X on the F, I'm going to tag that with a Y. And so, just for symmetry, let me make these ones sort of stand out nicely, too, so you can kind of see what's going on here. Of course, all of this notation does actually look like a, a matrix vector product, as it should, or as I claimed in any case. I can reorganize it so that it is a matrix of partial derivatives. Like so, that's the matrix. And there's the vector. And of course, this guy here, this is the Jacobian J matrix. And that matrix vector product is, in fact, what you really get. Because if you take row the first row and multiply it by the column vector, you'll get exactly the expression that we've got for the derivative with respect to t of the x component of f. Great. So that's pretty neat. All right, so how does this f then transform angles? Because remember, this is just transforming one path. Transforming angles means I need to transform both paths. So let's use what we just learned and answer the question. Answer the question. How? does f transform angles between paths? Well, angles between paths are angles between vectors. They're tangent vectors. So let's write that out. That's the tangent vector for P. Here's the tangent vector for Q. I'm leaving the of T's because just there's too many parentheses otherwise. Okay. So that's just substituting into the formula. And now making use of making use of what we just solved for how these vectors, tangent vectors get transformed, i.e. this formula right here. It's really the Jacobian matrix of F times P prime dot product with the Jacobian matrix times q prime. And of course, divide away their lengths. 
Okay, a little bit more simplification. Well, let's transpose. Let's write it out all in matrix vector products rather than in terms of uh, dot products and lengths. And here I'm making use of the fact that the way that I compute a length is by dot plotting a vec vector with itself and then taking the square root. If I go ahead and do this calculation, the thing to notice is that transposes, how do transposes work with products? Well, transposes reverse the order. like so. And same kind of things go on down here. Oops, that's supposed to be a P. Prime. And similarly. And so now we've kind of come to the end of the line. This is how it transforms. The thing to think about is this J, this J transpose J thing is making a new inner product. It's transforming the inner product. And F is conformal if it preserves angles. So I say if F is a conformal mapping, Conformal. It's, it's conformal if it, rather, say it this way, F is conformal if it preserves angles. I.e., this expression is actually equal to just erasing the J's everywhere. <laughs> And you might ask, well, how could that possibly happen? Well, it means that something like J transpose J is equal to 1, or at the very least, it cancels out. So there's, some, there's several possibilities. Of course, there are more. This is just some of them. Of course, if J is equal to the identity matrix, or J is equal to the identity matrix times a scalar, because then J will look like this diagonal matrix. And of course, J times transpose J, uh, or J transpose times J will, of course, look like a diagonal matrix. It'll get spit out of the numerator and the denominator in exactly the same amount, and they'll cancel. Another possibility is if it's a rotation matrix. Because then, if I take a look at J transpose times J, it's an orthogonal matrix, which means J transpose times J is an identity matrix. So these are some possibilities that will give you conformal maps. The thing to notice is this Jacobian matrix is built out of derivatives of F. It is local, which means that it can sort of preserve the shape locally, preserves angles locally. So what you will see the image of F, if you just look in some small area, will look very much like the, the domain of F where it came from. But farther away, it may get a bit distorted. So globally, conformal mappings may be rather distorting, even though locally they're not. So it's good to think about some possible examples of conformal maps, and actually you've seen some of them. And they're actually maps not in the math sense, but in the geography sense. So a classic conformal mapping is the Mercator projection. 
the Mercator projection is a conformal map and it preserves angles and that's actually why it was very popular amongst sailors because they could take their compass bearings directly off of this map and move them around on the map and everything looks right from a compass bearing standpoint. Of course near the equator on this particular conformal mapping there's very little distortion. Your Jacobian matrix looks very much like an identity matrix but away from the equator the distortion becomes rather severe not in terms of shapes. The shapes are still pretty close to being right because all the angles are pretty close to being right. But the areas are rather not right. And the reason for that is because the conformal map looks very much like th this kind of structure far away from the equator. Now how does it get built? Well it gets built by way of a, a projection. And in particular it gets built by way of a projection that looks a bit like this. The sphere is the earth and the map kind of wraps around the Earth, and you take a path like that blue line, and it goes through the center of the Earth. Start out at the center of the Earth, pass through the point you're interested in, and where that straight line intersects the sheet of paper wrapped around the Earth, that's where that point gets mapped to. And so you can see how this map works is that the lines of longitude, the vertical lines, are all pretty evenly spaced. But the lines of latitude they match up pretty well with the lines of latitude on the Earth near the equator, but as you get closer to the poles, they get really spread out. They get, and that, that accounts for the distortion in area. But the angles are still pretty good. How can you tell? Because the lines of longitude and latitude are perpendicular everywhere on the surface of the Earth. They're always at 90 degrees to each other. Of course, not at the North and South Pole. Then they kind of do something wacky. Uh, but every other point, lines of longitude and latitude are perpendicular and they are also perpendicular on the Mercator projection. So that's pretty neat. But are there other conformal maps? Yes, there's actually lots of them. Here's another example of a conformal map. This one here is built out of something called a stereographic projection. This one I've centered on the North Pole, and it looks pretty good right around the North Pole. The areas are pretty decent, the angles are all preserved, everything looks great. As you get far away from the North Pole, inevitably the distortion gets really bad. How does this map get built? This map get, gets built by a similar kind of structure. But rather than drawing a line through the center of the Earth, you grab your line at one of the poles, pass it through the point you're interested in, take a straight line and smack it into your map. There's your map sitting in this case here this is the Earth upside down. This is really the South Pole, and there's the North Pole. And I drew a line from the South Pole through some point, and it touches here. You'll notice the lines of latitude and longitude down here are still perpendicular locally, even though overall it's kind of circular. And so that is kind of a good indication that this is a conformal map. As it happens, there's plenty of other conformal maps, many of them coming, coming about from complex analysis, as you can see in some of the other videos uh, that I have on my channel. But the point is, conformal maps turn out to be very useful and turn out to be one of the reasons why complex analysis has so many applications. It's because you can cook up a conformal map that preserves shape very nicely, and it doesn't necessarily preserve angle, or it doesn't preserve area, it preserves angle, and that allows you to at least see things that are shaped correctly. In fact, the map kind of conforms to the surface you're working with, and complex analysis provides a very convenient way to construct many of these conformal maps. They also have the benefit that conformal maps uh, preserve harmonic functions, solutions to the Laplace's equation, which is perhaps one of the most important partial differential equations, and has many, many applications to physics and biology and many other places as well.